Who doesn't need an introduction because on this subject, I think he's an expert on this. Uh, his topic is severe acute malnutrition management. Uh, he's professor, senior professor in pediatrics, University of Colombo, and he's a consultant pediatrician of Lady Hospital. Uh, 
Over to you, Pujita. Thank you, madam. It on chat box or at the end of the session, you can you may ask questions. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you all could see the slides on the screen, those who are on Zoom. So uh, coming on to the topic of management principles of severe acute malnutrition, this is actually the extreme end of the spectrum of malnutrition. Because if you look at malnutrition is actually wrong nutrition. So there is a little bit of misnomer also when you say malnutrition, what really goes through our mind is a thin skin and bone sort of looking individual. But uh, in today's context, with the emergence of overweight and obesity, this has got a little bit of a uh, more expanded spectrum. So actually, really speaking, today I will be discussing mainly about undernutrition. So it could be uh, excess or uh, overweight, uh, deficiency both sides. Now, usually in nutrition, when we provide the nutrients, it will provide for the basal metabolism digestion and absorption, and day-to-day -day activity, extra physical activity, then the next would be growth, as well as if there is any excess, that would be uh, stored for later usage. That is how the human have evolved, because it was not 24-7 availability, it was the hunter-gatherer, where there were good times as well as bad times. So when there is a deficiency, what will happen is, the functions will gradually uh, regress in this order, where the storage will go off, growth will get affected, then gradually the functionality will get affected. So that's why a malnourished child is preferred to always to stay in a site without much activity because nature's way is to preserve the life, not to uh, expend the balance energy and exert and uh, get into shorten the lifespan. So similarly, when there is excess of calories, this is what will happen. So when you take nutrients, we know broadly it's there are macronutrients, micronutrients. The macronutrients will lead to over and under nutrition, which we call in the excess fat deposition or less fat and muscle. Or it could be micronutrients on the other hand, which we also call as the hidden hunger because some of these things may not be quite visible. Now, when it comes to malnutrition or specifically undernutrition, really, it is primary undernutrition and secondary undernutrition. So primary means the availability of food is not there. That is mainly on the dependent population. It may be children, it may be elders who are confined to institutions like that. But on the other hand, today what we mostly see is actually a disease-related secondary malnutrition, either due to absorption problems or due to excess calorie consumption. But of course, the fear is that we would we be beginning to see more and more primary malnutrition in coming uh, days. So there had been many classifications of uh, undernutrition over the years, starting from late 50s, going on to, well, you all may have heard Gomez classification, Waterloo classific uh, welcome classification, then Waterloo. Breaking out from Waterloo's classification is actually what this WHO ultimately came up. We are using the C scores. Based on the C scores, uh, the definitions had been developed. So without going into further detail on that, if we can really, because the population is a learned population, they are, these would be the cutoff values. And under nutrition, now, if you concentrate on the one to five year column, you will see that basically based on the weight for height. Now, separately, you look into height for age and look whether they're stunting or not. 
And on the other hand, we look for weight for height and look whether there is categorization into under nutrition or over nutrition. In the higher age group, about five years, we use the BMI. In the weight for height category, under nutrition, moderate any person who is less than minus two standard deviations, we would consider them as undernourished and minus two to minus three, moderate under nutrition. And if anybody less than minus three is uh, severe under nutrition. So that is how we basically categorize. And for our ease, the CHDR contains these set of charts where up to two years we use weight for length, about two years we use weight for height. And you can see the yellow line uh, the yellow color bar is minus two to minus three, whereas the red color zone is below minus three zone. So this is the best way because we try to see whether the person has matching amount of uh, weight to match the, the height of the individual. So that's how we basically look at the uh, wasting. So severe wasting would be either weight for height less than minus three, but of course, for rapid uh, field detections, we also use the uh, mid upper arm circumference. That is the when the arm is relaxing by the side of the individual midpoint between the acromion and the olecranon process of the uh, upper limb. So that is if it is less than 11.5 centimeters, we also take as a level for wasting in one to five year old children. Then, of course, stunting is severe stunting is if they are less than minus three in the height for age chart. Now, this is, of course, is a common uh, chart which you all, all know that poverty, of course, leads to poor food intake as well as poor environment, and each other goes into contributing to development of malnutrition as well as infection. So, this vicious cycle where a malnourished child is easily prone to develop infection. And once they get infected, they become malnourished. And this goes on a vicious cycle. So if we are to break this, if we are to treat malnutrition, of course, we have to hardly hit this vicious cycle and try to break it at a point. Now, in the management, of course, the important thing is once we have detected a child is having what any form of undernutrition, whether it is moderate or whether it is severe, we have to find the underlying cause because we may treat it acutely, but if we have not taken away the underlying cause, then of course it will, as I showed you earlier, they will go into the vicious cycle and then keep on uh, alternatively get, getting uh, malnourished from time to time. Then identify any complications, related complications also we have to like infections or any other thing have to be looked into. Then we have to look into the socioeconomic background because if we don't correct that and if we send them back into that same environment, of course, we know that they will return after a short period of time because they can't sustain or they will not have adequate uh, environment, favorable environment for them to go on. And of course, we have to also recognize this 10 factors, what is called the adverse childhood experiences. This is a new area which is emerging where there are various ab ab uh, abuses, neglects, as well as household uh, dysfunctioning that takes place. And this, if we don't correct, because now uh, malnutrition is actually not only providing food, it is much correction of malnutrition is not only providing food. It is much more beyond that. So it is important that we correct these factors. If we don't correct these factors, then there is no use at all because we will see, especially for stunting, it has been saying stunting is not equal to undernutrition or malnutrition because there are a lot of other factors because stunting is not, will get affected by short term food shortage. But of course, the environmental, if the environment is not happy, not conducive, of course, there are a lot of negative factors that are negative hormones, negative uh, metabolites that will be secreted throughout the body and that will affect the 
uh, growth of the individual. So these are all together we have to look in rather than we detect a child and then providing the nutrient is not going to be sufficient. So once we come across a child, we have to take a good detailed medical history, dietary history, then development, birth weight, immunization, contact with infected persons and things like that, especially like tuberculosis and all. Then anthropometry, edema, nutritional deficiency, specific targeted nutritional examination have to be done as well as system wise. Then of course, we may have to do some basic investigation, especially to identify whether there are any acute undernutrition related complications like hypoglycemia, anemia, infections, electrolyte imbalances, that type of thing or renal dysfunctions. And then also to do a required basic screening from the infection point of view. So severe acute malnutrition successful treatment will depend on how early we have detected these cases. Because if it is more and more deviated from the norm, then of course, it is much more harder to get them back on track. Similarly, if there are any complications, uh, sorry, the compliance to treatment is also. So that means where the home environment, there should be a reasonable, reliable carer who would be able to understand or identify and provide the necessary management in the home front. So because of that, the most important thing is that you have to detect them. So I think anybody who is practicing pediatrics day to day in their clinics, this is very important that they do the screening from time to time and see whether there is appropriate weight for uh, height or weight for length is there in children under five years of age because early detection is means quick and easy uh, control. So once we have detected a child with severe uh, wasting or what we call as SAM, then they can be having, after our quick assessment, we can identify whether they have complications or whether they do not have any complications. So if they have no complications, that means the appetite is good. Clinically, the person is well and the child is very alert. So that means he will have a fairly good appetite. And if we provide with the required food, then of course the child will be able to manage. So provided that there is a good care, we could manage them in the outpatient department. And then what we have to do, we have to give feeding counseling. We may have to provide feeding ingredients, uh, then uh, basic health care, as well as nutritional counseling, because it is not 100% therapeutic only we have to strike a balance and provide homemade food items as well. Then on the other hand, if we detect any complications, it may be loss of appetite, infections, high fever, any of those medical conditions, then of course, it is, they have to be institutionalized and managed. So in that, we have to look after the medical side of the care provide the required, maybe any complications, it may be electrolyte imbalances, glycemic control problems, as well as infections, as well as begin with the therapeutic feeding. So in the main algorithm of functioning, when they have detected severe malnutrition, you try to look after the main complications as soon as possible. So it can be hypoglycemia, Hypothermia, of course, not a very big problem, except for places like Nuwar area, Badul, that part, I mean, uh, Bandaravela, that part of area, probably. But otherwise, dehydration, electrolyte imbalances, infections are the immediate things that we have to attend to that. So that's why targeting those things, we would do the investigations and gather the information and then do the appropriate coverage with antibiotics, uh, rehydration, either orally or parenterally, uh, and then provide the required glucose and things like that. Then, of course, we have to provide the micronutrients, especially the B group of vitamins have to be provided because that required for the respiratory cycle. And we know if we don't provide them, then, of course, complications, especially things like beriberi could occur. So you have to make sure that all vitamins and minerals should be provided, except for iron, because iron has a adverse effect on the initial feeding with 
potentiating of development of infections and things like that. So then, of course, also we start on initiating with the feeding. So this is a crude chart. This is a chart of the uh, rehydration solution. I have compared the main two, that is new ORS and the old ORS solution, which was very high. But of course, in in uh, malnutrition, the dehydration is actually not because of the loss. It is because of the inge less ingestion of the food and the required electrolytes. So because of this reason, they usually have a relative hypernatremic dehydration. So if you give large amounts of sodium, they can go into a different state of physiology and re result in hypernatremia and more. So therefore, you have to actually, ideally speaking, a low sodium and a high potassium solution should be given. So this is a commercial-based preparation, which is called Resomel. And then, of course, you can see the composition. Of course, additional of uh, micronutrients are there, but the micronutrients are not necessary. These are, of course, a little bit of a commercial gimmicks also. But most important uh, part is the uh, low sodium and the high potassium which is required for this uh, particular management. And also a reasonable amount of low osmolality because there is disuse atrophy of the gut, the villus atrophy is there, so they can go into a, a smaller diarrhea. So inpatient management, of course, whatever it is, you have to give them a liquid solution and it has to be a little bit of a low or smaller solution. As I told you, there is villus atrophy and they can go into a diarrhea condition. So because of that, we start with a low or smaller solution and start with a low calorie value, roughly about 75, kilo, 75 to 80 kilocalories per kilogram per day initially. So in the first few days, we will go like that and then gradually increase it. So this solution has, this is a commercial preparation, again, F75, and that contains 75 kilocalories in 100 milliliters. <coughs> Sorry. So once uh, that, as well as the micronutrients, especially vitamin A should be given, and zinc as well as B complex, as I uh, outlined earlier. Then once the child is now tolerating, you gradually increase the calorie density. You can go up to calculation-wise, you can go up to 100, 120 like that. So with that, the volume will expand if you are sticking into 75 kilocalories, so you have to go for a higher concentrated solution. That is where this F100 business comes into the picture, where this contains 1 ml, 1 kilocalorie, or 100 kilocalories in 100 milliliter solution. And then here you can keep on increasing your calorie uh, administration. Even you can go up to about 200, 220 kilocalories per kilogram per day for the individual based on the amount that the child tolerates. So once we are going like that, of course, then uh, we cannot keep on this much of calorie density. So we have to go for higher. So that is where the red to use therapeutic food comes into the picture, which has a kilocalorie density of about 100 grams has about 500 kilocalories. So that will help us to give large amount of nutrients or calories with a less volume of food. But of course, when you give certain RUTS, you have to make sure that adequate amount of fluid is given. So when we are going this, that is going on to a more solidified based, solid based diet, where we will come down in the F100, which is a more liquid diet. So, oh, sorry about that. So if there is now after about first week, one and a half weeks, you can't make a good assessment the appetite and uh, loss of edema, those type of things have to be taken into consideration for the response. But uh, the weight gain, of course, usually after about 10 days in the second week, it is best to assess. And any 10 grams per kilogram per day increment is considered as a good response. Anything below five grams per kilogram per day should be again thoroughly investigated in order to find out whether there is any other underlying problem which we have not addressed so far. So the local guide also have given a sample how we can produce a 75 kilocalorie, 100 ml as well as 100 kilocalorie per 100 ml solutions uh, in this 
aspect. So coming on to reduce therapeutic foods so far, they are actually they are in, they are available commercially, which has a very long shelf life and does not require water to prepare, but of course they need clean water in order to consume after that. And popular two commercial preparations were uh, the BP100 as well as plump peanut. Plump peanut was a, a peanut butter based uh, preparation, which we tried out both of these products, of course, depending on the regional variation of the uh, liking, they were uh, taking that. In Colombo, of course, people preferred BP100, whereas in Jaffna and Northern province, the children were preferring uh, the peanut based preparation. So mainly we use that and you can see the energy density, 527 kilocalories per 100 grams and 92 grams of plump peanut has 500 kilocalories. So this is the energy amount. And at the moment for information, the MRI is doing some research and we have prepared the uh, formulas and uh, it will be now going on for field testing among children to see the acceptability. So once we keep on going that, we will, as I said earlier, towards the second week, we will be seeing catching up growth and they are returning their weight gain. And then it is very important that we sensory wise stimulate, we give certain amount of activity based on them and then prepare them for follow up because we have to empower the parents. We have to see how they can cope up with the thing, how the preparation, how to pick early signs in a child who is recovering from malnutrition, all that have to be uh, taught. So once uh, the child is able to, I mean, appetite is good that the child is uh, taking food and not uh, very reserved, not moribund sort of a state, then medical complications all been uh, controlled and the child is well, there is almost no uh, edema, then of course we will be able to discharge them. But to discharge from home, always they not have to come up to the MAM state. They could be still in the SAM state, provided these criteria have been fulfilled. And once they are reached more above minus two standard deviation, that means they are no more categorized as a severe acute undernourished child because minus two to minus three is moderate acute undernutrition. At that point, of course, then you can stop and do we have to stop the BP100 or the reduced therapeutic food and go for the normal supplementary programs which are available, mainly Triposha or CSB preparation. Now Triposha has about 400 kilocalories per 100 kilograms, uh, 100 grams of uh, the food item. So this is how we, are, we started very low in minus three, then with time gradually crossed. So at this point, we will stop the uh, reduced therapeutic food, but we continue to follow them because still they are in a danger zone where they can revert back to the original state. So we continue during the yellow zone, we will follow them up, but instead of reduced therapeutic food, we would be giving them uh, any other supplementary food like Triposha, and then we continue to follow them. So once they have come up to the minus one line or above that, then of course that would be the point where we will be discharging completely from the follow-up program. So that is the time, that, that is, those are the basic principles that we adopt when we are managing a severe acute malnutrition or severe acute undernutrition. And the whole national guideline is there with the national circular also, which has been put out. And uh, this can be downloaded free of charge from the uh, Family Health Bureau Child Nutrition uh, component of the website. Thank you. Thank you, Pujita. That was a very extensive discussion on CV acute malnutrition. Uh, there are participants on Zoom. I think quite a number. If there are any questions, please send your questions. And at the end of the session, we will take the questions. Uh, shall we move on to the next speaker? Uh, Professor Ishani Rodrigo. Uh, she's Professor of Pediatrics, General Sir John Kotlavale Defense Academy, Defense University. Uh, she's, uh, she's going to speak on childhood obesity and overview. 
Thank you, Madam, for that kind introduction. So um, uh, Pujita was talking about the one end of the malnutrition spectrum, and uh, I will focus on the other end of the spectrum of malnutrition, which is, which is obesity in childhood. Um, so I'm, I'm, my interest in obesity is as a, as a pediatrician, when you see children, with, I think, more than when I was a medical student, when we start practicing to see more and more children coming with overweight and obesity, and that something has to be done to help them because we really did not have any kind of dedicated service to uh, uh, serve this kind of children. So um, now obesity is defined as a condition where there is excess body fat, and that is associated with adverse health outcomes. And um, as I mentioned, we have during our sort of several decades of uh, uh, looking after children, we have seen obesity increasing, uh, rates of obesity increasing quite alarmingly. Initially, I think when we were medical students, we, were, we would think obesity is a problem of high income countries, but now we are seeing an increasing problem both in middle and low income countries. And because we have more children in this part of the world, absolute numbers are much more in uh, uh, low and middle income countries. So <clears throat> if you look at the US statistics, um, more than 17 million children are obese. And if you take overweight and obese together, one in three, two to 19 year olds are either overweight or obese, and it's a staggering health cost. Uh, if you look at the rest of the world, since 1975, obesity has almost tripled. And according to the WHO um, statistics, under five, 39 million children worldwide are overweight or obese. And if you concentrate on the five to 19 year age category, 340 million children are overweight or obese. So that's a staggering number of children who have this problem. And um, when we look at the low and the middle income countries in Africa since 2000, overweight and obesity has increased by almost 25%. What about our own uh, uh, figures? Most of these uh, come from different studies done by individuals. I think one of the first studies was done by Pujita and his team who looked at eight to 12 year old school children in urban schools in Karambu and published in 2004, they arrived at figures of 4.3% of boys and 3.1 girls were obese. The same, or uh, Fujita's team looked at the five to 18, a slightly higher age group, including adolescents in almost um, 10 years later, and found that 10.3% were obese and 11.3% were overweight. So although the age groups are slightly different, you can see a much uh, rapid uh, increase in rate. Then from different parts of the, uh, of the country, um, Geeta Satyadatsa's group looked at overweight and obesity in Jaffna and among 16, six to 16 year old school children, 17.3 were found to be overweight and obese. Then from Kendi, 7.81% overweight and 6.79 obese in the 12 to 15 year old group. So um, from starting from childhood, going on to adolescence, we are seeing large, a rapid increase in figures of overweight and obesity. Um, one particular study which took the rural, rural uh, rates of malnutrition from the North Central province found that this, the schools that they studied were uh, very difficult to access um, groups where the population is quite different from the urban, uh, urban schools studied in the previous, previous studies. And they found that 2.95% were overweight and 2.4% were obese, which is probably what we had before all these rising figures started to appear. So uh, within the country, we are seeing uh, uh, urban-rural 
divide and probably related to the um, both the, 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 the access to nutrients maybe. So most, the etiology of obesity in ch children, mostly what we are seeing is simple obesity where there is a excess calories are taken over the amount expended. So the excess gets deposited in the body. And <clears throat> so the contributory factors would be food, physical activity or inactivity, and then certain lifestyle, screen time, etc. On a background of genetics, like, I mean, there is no one single gene. There are a lot, large number of genes which contribute small amounts to a person uh, becoming obese. So in a background, uh, a polygenic background, these different factors would make somebody more prone to become obese. We do see uh, syndromic obesity, endocrine, drug related, et cetera, but they are, they are quite rare. The basic, uh, 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 the emphasis is on simple obesity. So how do you detect obesity or diagnose obesity? It, ideally, it would be a measurement of body fat, but in a practical sense and in, in, in a clinical practice, that's not possible. So we use anthropometric measurements of height and weight and derive certain statistics to um, uh, uh, diagnose overweight and obesity and put the showed some of this before. So according to the WHO uh, categorization, under five, weight for height of more than two SD and weight for height is uh, overweight and more than three SD above the median is obese. In the five to 19 category, we use the BMI for age, more than one SD above the median is overweight and more than two SD is obese. So this is what we have in our child health development record for under five, the light purple and the dark purple areas are respectively overweight and obese. And in the BMI charts, again, the, w, the, the light purple and the dark purple areas, that's plus one to plus two and over plus two SD. So these are actually readily available in the CHDR and we need to use this um, uh, uh, more often. And I think as a regular practice, if we use, then we can pick what is happening. The, CDC criteria for overweight and obese are slightly different where they use the BMI centiles from the entire two to 19 year age category, 85th to 95th centile um, is considered overweight and over 95th obese. So why are we worried about overweight and obesity? Because it affects overall health, both physical and mental. Uh, being overweight and obese cause more deaths than being underweight. And there are uh, the, most of these children who become obese as children continue to continue on that trend and they become obese adults and with the consequence, both psychological, social, as well as medical issues. And during the last, the, the COVID pandemic, we did see an increase in obesity because of obvious reasons of, you know, unable to get out of the house, inadequate screen time, etc. Plus the outcomes from COVID was much, much more severe in the obese category. Now with the current economic crisis, we might see different trends, but as, as it is, this is what we see. So in terms of physical health, childhood obesity causes conditions which were previously not really seen in children, but only seen in adults, including hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, dyslipidemia, type two diabetes, fatty liver disease, both non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Then respiratory problems, mainly obstructive sleep apnea, see them struggling to sleep with loud snoring at night. And then asthma becomes quite difficult to control joint problems, infertility, et cetera. In terms of mental health, although we might not um, give too much uh, emphasis on this, this is an area which, has to, which needs more research because they do have poor self-image, they get bullied, um, poor academic performance, both as a result of all this is happening and also the expectations from a child who's obese <laughs> is traditionally not that high. The teachers tend to sometimes identify obese children as, you know, not very intelligent people. So that that adds to the cycle. 
So they are, that can lead to depression, suicide or attempted suicide. So that's an area that we really need to concentrate on when we uh, handle children with problems of weight. So it's a vicious cycle, childhood obesity leading to adult obesity. When a child, a healthy child due to various factors that we've mentioned become mildly obese and then you know, is reluctant to move, becomes moderately obese, becomes severely obese and then becomes an obese adult. So this is the cycle that we need to break. And to break it, it's best thing is to act, act during childhood rather than waiting for them to become obese adults. So in approaching the problem, as with most of the other conditions, prevention is the most rational and the successful strategy because once obesity is established, it is extremely difficult to treat and to sustain the, the momentum. Uh, what we see is that um, when we intervene, you do see short-term gains, but there is a rebound weight gain when you sort of you know, reduce the intensity of intervention. You need very intensive interventions, a multi-pronged approach to and a change in sort of you know, attitudes and behavior to assist with get necessary long-term results. And the interventions have to happen at, at each level, individual, family, community, and national level to be really successful. So I think as Pujita mentioned, regular monitoring of the great growth parameters, that's the key to early identification, because if you identify early, then you can intervene early and prevent this vicious cycle from um, uh, occurring. So one of the very important things I think is to educate the healthcare workers, because now we do educate them on, uh, on uh, growth flattening and growth faltering, but the emphasis we give them and the idea that we give them about rapid weight gain increase crossing the, the, the Z lines upward is not very good. Actually, the mothers whose children who are gaining weight rapidly are actually <laughs> praised, I think, by the, the field healthcare workers for a job well done. And so we have a problem of telling them, look, this is not, not good that you need to intervene to get this weight to an acceptable level. So that's an area where we really, as, as uh, pediatricians, and I think working together with the Family Health Bureau, we need to do some educational programs to show them that both downward trends and upward trends are not good, that they should follow um, parallelly to whatever their growth potential lines. And if you can intervene early, then of course, you don't have to wait till they become obese. So that uh, it's the, the, the difficult task is not so difficult. So in the initial assessment, you do need a comprehensive history, things like birth weight and the weight trajectory. When did they start crossing the, crossing the lines upward? A detailed dietary history where you need to know the type of food they take, especially the portion sizes. So because your, your portion size might not match the portion size the child takes. Then frequency of feeding, sometimes what we see is uh, the parents say, okay, they eat these meals, but if you really go into detail, you find that they have their meal, and when the parents are having a meal, they will have another meal. So the, the, unless you actually get them to write it down, um, you find that, that that information is not accurate. Then about snacks, what type of snacks, and how frequent they take the snacks, and beverages. Now, most of the time, when you ask them what, what they eat, they do not mention what they drink. So you will find... Um, uh, sweetened beverages, maybe maybe fruit juices, sweetened milk, etc., uh, taking a, a quite a big portion of their diets. Then family history, especially relatives with weight issues, mother, father, siblings, grandparents, etc., and some of them actually do have complications of obesity. So all that information will help you to plan a successful strategy for overcoming this problem. Drug history might be important in certain children who are put on specialist steroids, sometimes for severe bronchial asthma or necrotic syndrome, et cetera. But generally, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very important part to ask whether such a factor is there. Then about physical activity, both in school, out of school, how, how much time they spend being physically active. Screen time, especially in this uh, era of online education, et cetera, that 
the, the number of hours spent on screen has increased quite a lot from when they actually go to school physically. Sleep hours is another very important thing. And what we find is children who do not have adequate sleep tend to put on weight. So it's important to con uh, concentrate on that as well. Then of course, it's necessary to do a psychological assessment, find they are, whether they are getting bullied, their self-esteem, et cetera. And also another very important thing is the perception of the child and the family toward the weight. Most of the time, they might not be very concerned. So you do have to work with them and show that, uh, uh, that they need to, if their perception is that a fat child is a healthy child, then it is a very difficult problem to tackle. Right? So you see, it is a, usually a family issue. The, if you look at the pictures, you will see it's the mother, father, uh, all siblings all tend to be of a bigger size. In the initial assessment, uh, physical examination is important. So apart from the usual anthropometric measurements of height and weight, we need waist circumference, which will give an indication of the abdominal fat. Then there might be features indicating etiology like syndromic features, really. Signs of insulin resistance are very common. We see acanthosis, um, thickened, dark skin, back of the neck and in the axilla, et cetera. Blood pressure should be measured. And here, I think it's very really important to use appropriate size cuff because using small cuffs for children who are quite obese will give you a erroneous reading. Skin stria, then in boys, gynecomastia is an issue and that actually might not revert to normal even with getting your weight down. So you have to act quite early to see this kind of a thing happening. Then skeletal abnormalities of bow legs, flat feet, knock knees, scoliosis. So see what is there. And early onset osteoarthritis is quite common, especially when they come to adolescents. Features of polycystic ovarian disease might be there in adolescent girls. Exam see their mobility and then do an assessment of their physiological status and level of motivation to correct their uh, uh, weight back to a more healthy level. And of course, plot on appropriate charts and arrive at a uh, 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 whether it is overweight or obese or normal weight. We do do some initial assessment, some baseline investigations, which will include fasting blood sugar or a two-hour postprandial blood sugar after glucose load, AST and ALT to see whether there is hepatitis, lipid profile, and ultrasound abdomen, which might show fat deposition in the liver. And the blood investigations are usually done after about a 12 hour fast so that you get a reasonably standard results. In the management, I mean, there is no one way you manage obesity, but the most successful way is a family-based approach where you try to do some behavior change. Um, you need to discuss your concerns and listen to the family concerns because most of the time, when we encounter children with obesity, they haven't come for obesity. They have come for some other problem like asthma or a respiratory tract infection or a viral fever. Because you have done their anthropometric measurements and plotted on this appropriate chart, you realize that there is issue. So starting point actually is to voice your concerns and then listen to what the family feels about it. And that otherwise it's not going to work. I think the focus is on getting healthy rather than losing weight because um, if you uh, stick that because being all fat or obese carries a certain amount of stigma and if you talk about health getting healthy that might put on a more positive uh, uh, face on the entire approach so you had when your management plan you have to make a plan agreeable to both the child and the family. And of course, regular monitoring and feedback is extremely important because one encounter is not going to solve the problem at all. So in the strategy, you would talk about food types, portion sizes, snacks, and beverages. Then about physical activity, 60 to 90 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Screen time, try to reduce to less than two hours per day sleep, eight to 10 hours of sleep and some relaxation. So those are sort of the broad areas that you would concentrate on. And to uh, help children and families in deciding about food, um, in our clinic, we use a, we use a like a portion size uh, 
a thing which we developed ourselves using local food and and sort of you know what alternatives you can use because however much you educate them saying this and that unless they see it really as a picture uh, they do not really grasp that this is what we mean so this we are using because everybody then uses the same kind of approach and then also about school children important to talk about what snacks they take to school the portion sizes so again a picture guide which we use and then this is actually one uh, thing a parent did this is the child's food plate and they now we have uh, whatsapp and whatever so they take photographs and send this send the images so we can concentrate on correcting if it is wrong so this this is something that we try in our clinic so we ask them to maintain a food diary if possible photographic and share it with us so that we can uh, uh, correct what is, or if it is not quite right. Maintain an exercise log of whatever activities they have done and the time, screen time chart, sleep time chart. And of course we have groups, the child as well as the parent groups, WhatsApp groups where they can communicate with each other and share their problems. So, um, so that, that's the approach that we use. And I mean, in, I think different parts of the world, people are using different approaches, but whatever it is, it has to be a behavior chain. It has to be very intensive and you have to follow them up, trying to maintain um, uh, the, the, the weight as the child grows. So initially it's about a weight stabilization rather than a weight loss. So if you set up achievable goals, it's not, practical no is it very good to set unrealistic goals so you just give for each week or each month a split goal for the child um, emphasizing on stabilization of weight and slow loss rather than a rapid weight loss and at each point you have to positively reinforce on achieving these goals and taking taking measures to avoid food rewards so if the child has achieved a, we say a one kilogram loss in weight you don't reward by you know giving a slab of chocolate or whatever it can offer something an enjoyable family activity like you know going to the beach or playing a football match or whatever then of course throughout this you have to keep them motivated sometimes we find that you know getting getting uh, somebody to talk to them helps psychologists helps assessment of complications including psychological issues and of course regular monitoring and feedback so th that that's a sort of general approach we use and um, with that I think it's possible to prevent the rise you might not be able to get them completely to normal but at least you can prevent them from worsening their obesity then of course at a national and um, local community level you can do other things although we say increase physical activity for a child who's living in a flat there might not be any place for them to exercise and parents are so paranoid about letting children out. They are not allowed to go out of the house. So having playgrounds, et cetera, in communities where there is very little space for them to play. Then of course, um, uh, emphasizing on things like school canteen policies, making healthy food available and removing the unhealthy choices is another approach that should be able to take as a, as a whole, as a national level. Then of course, other things which have been tried at we also had something like a sugar tax, you know, uh, uh, putting these red and orange labels on beverages which contain extra of this thing. And policy is about advertising food. Now you, for children, use food advertisements. They, if you advertise unhealthy food, then that's probably very detrimental. So you need national policies for that. And of course, to create a public dialogue on weight issues and um, which hopefully will uh, uh, set people thinking about it. I think that is all I have in this presentation and after that we will do the discussion. Thank you, Ishani, for speaking to us on childhood obesity. Uh, and you emphasize that childhood obesity is not good at all. And you said the, the fat child is a healthy child. Those days, overweight and fat children were considered as a fashion. They are more fashionable than the thin children. Those days, it was 
considered fashionable to be fat. Not only the children, but even the infants. Uh, we'll come to the now third component of this, uh, that is by the energetic secretary of Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, Dr. Amali Dalpadadu. She is going to uh, do a case discussion, the moderation of the discussion. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving this opportunity for the College of Pediatricians to uh, coordinate and uh, do this very special seminar. And it's a privilege for me to stand here with two of my very respected teachers in the same forum, uh, Professor Pujita Vikramasinghe and Professor Shani Rodrigo. Um, one, uh, the professor in pediatrics in University of Colombo and the other, my immediate uh, senior and my boss currently. So it's a thank you again for uh, allowing us to uh, speak to you on this forum. Uh, can I get the uh, slides on the projector? Yeah. Actually, these were the cases uh, given by my teachers as well. So I'm just going to moderate and they're going to actually give you the uh, talk. Uh, so uh, I think this, this case is to uh, Professor Shani Rodrigo. Uh, this is a BMI chart of a child who is uh, five to nine years old. Uh, and I would like Madam to describe, you can see the uh, growth uh, plotted upwards towards the purple zone. And uh, can we discuss what sort of management, what sort of interventions that we would do? I don't know whether you can appreciate the uh, age in uh, years is mentioned down, down. So from seven to nine years, there's a climbing up of the weight. Over to you, madam. This child, when we, this child was seen around nine years, and at that time, the child was already in the obese area. But when we go back, we go back on the, on the looking, using the information sometimes available on the school medical inspection. You can see that the child has been overweight at um, uh, seven years of age and probably not much intervention has been done. So I think one of the things that we need to do is so up to five years, there is reasonable amount of information in the CHDR at least uh, regarding weight. You might not have very much information about the height, but after five years, the amount of it, there is absolutely no information because nobody bothers to plot. But if you look at the school medical inspection, there are uh, points in time where the height and the weight has been measured. And what I, I do in my practice is to use that information and plot and see what has happened. So here you can see the child has already been overweight. And if we intervened at that point, then the child may not have gone up. So now it's a difficult problem, but uh, uh, even at that late point, we have un we have identified a child as obese, and then of course this child needs a sort of a multi-pronged behavioral, family-based approach to get the weight down. The point I want to emphasize is use the information already available in the CHDR and and plot them so that you can identify. Because very rarely do they come with problem of obesity; they come with something else, and it's up to us to pick that up and act accordingly. Madam, just a small question again. Uh, could this be a case of simple obesity? 
information. With the given information. Right? What are the telltale marks to say that it's a, a pathological obesity in a child? I think one is height, usually syndromic as well as other causes of pathological obesity. The height is they are short, um, uh, then they might have syndromic features. Then of course, if they are using drugs like, for example, steroids, you might see the signs of steroid excess. Uh, uh, so those are some of the things, but. By and far, what we see are uh, simple obesity. I think the main thing to focus is on the height. If, the, if they're tall and tall and uh, uh, fat, then it's most likely simple obesity. Uh, just a small question, madam. If you're thinking only of overweight, would you be doing all the investigations that you mentioned or you would be trying your diet and exercise first and going for the investigations taken? I think it's always best to have baseline investigations because at least it's reassuring to know that they are at that particular point metabolically normal. And if they do do uh, uh, become obese, then you cannot have something to compare. And for parents also, it's a, it's quite reassuring to know that at this present moment their metabolic markers are all right. So I think it's a, I don't think there's any any uh, uh, exact guideline on when to investigate, but I would. I would investigate even when they present as overweight rather than waiting for them to be obese. Uh, thank you, madam. I know you do a wonderful clinic on uh, uh, obesity in, in our hospital and uh, you do, uh, do the psychological motivation as well in order to motivate these children. Um, madam, can you comment about this or would you like to... Yeah, so this eight-month-old baby growing from minus one to minus two SD, uh, deviating upwards from five months onwards across the median line at six months of age. Comments about this case. You know, this is something that we see uh, where the child has been, the child has been, has, has had a normal birth weight and has been growing. been growing uh, uh, between the minus one and the minus 60 till five months of age and probably somebody has instructed to start early weaning because the child is in the light green area and you can see a very uh, rapid weight gain crossing the lines so this is probably over enthusiastic complementary feeding and if you see that you need to work on it especially especially like um, the mothers are made to feel that they have to achieve higher weight gain. So correcting uh, and advising on the composition of complementary feeding and, and uh, regular monitoring so that the child's weight will stabilize so that this child probably will have to um, uh, uh, well into the second year. If you maintain this weight only, he will fall into the, the healthy weight category. So that uh, but the point is that infant feeding, especially introduction of complementary feeding, you have to advise them on the quality as well as the quantity the child really wants if you want to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Madam, would you like to comment on the levels and types of physical activity that you recommend at this age, six months of age? I think six months of age, it's very difficult because this child is uh, having very limited mobility. It is mainly the, the food that is causing this weight gain. So I think it's uh, child has been hopefully uh, ex exclusively breastfed till four months and the weight has been fine. So uh, breastfeeding has a protective effect on obesity. The longer the duration of breastfeeding, the, the lesser the incidence of obesity. So emphasize on, on continuing breastfeeding as well as providing uh, uh, good quality 
complementary feeding, but the portions have to be matched with the child. So what you call responsive feeding, just feed according to the child's hunger rather than what the mother or the grandmother thinks the child should eat. The, the, rather than making a huge pot of food and trying to force it down the child's uh, uh, mouth, then just concentrate on the on the response of the child. So with that, I think the weight will hopefully stabilize. Thank you, madam. Going to the next case. It's a five-year-old child growing along the minus one ST line till three years of age, deviating upwards and crossing the plus two ST line at five years of age. You can appreciate the child's uh, chart plotted. Would you like to comment on that, madam? This is, I think, something which happened during the COVID epidemic. Plus, the, the, the child from until three years of age, the child probably had very good uh, opportunities for, you know, playing and running and doing whatever. Probably may have been even attending preschool. But then the last couple of years has been quite disastrous in terms of activity and uh, food intake. So there has been quite rapid weight gain. Also, I think the monitoring now. This this the the, the points on the chart are three years and five years. In between, there has not been much monitoring done so when you when the child comes at five years you realize the child has child has crossed uh, several of the lines and become overweight at that point so here we are in a bit of a difficult situation because the child already has certain established food habits so you will have to work quite hard and to try to stabilize the weight and, and uh, get it down to normal level fortunately child is still growing in height so if there is a window of opportunity for us to act to get everything on track the parents have to be counseled and because at this age the child child has um, the parents have a reasonable control over the child un unlike an adolescent so if we work with the family and educate the parents and regular monitoring this probably can be worked out to uh, get a better level Yes, thank you, madam. Uh, going on to the next case, it's a nine-year-old child. We discussed that, Amal. Yeah. Thank you. Time. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have some questions for Professor Pooja Singh. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, the thing is, uh, actually, I mean, if the child is getting a reasonable good diet, then, of course, periodic uh, supplementation is what we recommend. Actually, the work is also like that. Now, the national schedule is uh, <clears throat> for normal children who are not who are normal birth weight and term babies at six months, 12 months, and 18 months. We give think, uh, the multiple micronutrient supplements for a two month period. So, <clears throat> those who are not going to the government sector could be provided with that accordingly. Because, I mean, we don't know, we don't do levels. Its levels are not that easy. But assuming they are at rapid growth, as well as considering the, the type of diet we take, because it has a little bit of inhibitory factors like phytate that would hinder the absorption of cations, then, of course, giving for about two-month period is what we adopt, actually, what should be adopted. So the WHO, based on that, the national model is to give multiple micronutrients for 60 days at three different time intervals. And then that, of course, will improve the metabolism and that will also improve the uh, feeding and the appetite. So the three periods would be six months, 12 months, and 18 months because we don't have adequate data. Now, for example, we are giving still vitamin A. But, of course, vitamin A levels, which we have done, even the MRI, I have done a small study, all that have shown that the children do have adequate levels. And especially with the diet diversity after nine months, then they pick up also. So if the more important thing is to actually to give a proper diverse diet, starting from the very early start. And uh, some of the things I don't agree is taking a long time to establish complementary feeding. Now, in my practice, of course, I straight away start the first three main me me meals in the morning. I give a breakfast, 10 o'clock snack, 
and 12 noon lunch that I start very early within about a couple of, uh, depends, uh, usually if they have been growing nicely, I go till six months of exclusive breastfeeding. But if the mother happens to be working mother, or if there's growth faltering by four months, then by that time I start. And within about two weeks, should be able to uh, establish a good uh, complementary feed. It's because sometimes some people advise give it one feed, wait for about another week and give it. So that is a long period of time. And then what happens sir, in between, the breastfeeding will come in. So the child will be like to feed onto the breast because it's easy to suck. It is more tastier, sugar content wise. So the attraction, the child will be sort of having a much more choice and he begins to latch onto the breast. And mother also thinks, okay, I can give only one feed today. Then, of course, there is a deviation. But if the child is given, cut down the breast milk frequency and then give the food, then the child also does not have much of a choice. So he established, I have actually, I have not done a case kind of study, but my experience is that establishes very well. Growth charts come back to normal. Then after about a couple of weeks later, starts the evening snack as well as the no, that is actually for those who are not uh, those who are preterm as well as low birth weight. Till two years of age, there is a rational circular that has to be given, sir. And I am. It's a, it's a, it's I, I don't know, sir. Right? Commercial preparations, I don't want to discuss, but yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, it. Yeah. But I think. I think people were going on for grow it because the cal, uh, the vitamin D cal content is higher than I think is Sinkovit is my understanding. I think when I had a discussion with Nishani, it was the thing transferred because for the bone uh, this. Thing. So you have to strike a balance. Sir. Probably a commercial preparation ideally will not provide us what we require. So now even the multiple micronutrient, the WHO recommendation is vitamin A, vitamin uh, iron and zinc. So anything other than that. So commercial preparations, what we get down is about 15 micronutrient content. So the other countries have 12, some have 18 like that. So we have to fall in line with the manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so case one, a four month old baby was brought to the clinic for routine vaccination. Baby is exclusively breastfed by the mother. Mother is a nursing officer attached to the peripheral unit, which is situated about one kilometer away from home. And she's planning to take full maternity leave. Baby's active and developmentally age appropriate. What advice would you give to this mother? You can appreciate the growth chart on the right hand side of the slide. So yeah, this is a common thing, but you will see actually. And because there is a misnorm, I mean. It has been interpreted wrongly sometimes when you say exclusive breast feeding till six months, that is nothing else could be given. But of course, the guideline quite clearly, the circular clearly outlined that if the growth faltering is there or if the mother is not available for breast feeding, then of course, complementary feeding can be started after four months because we know the extrusion reflex is no more there. So this is what happens in the field. What we see is sometimes now you can see at four months, the child has deviated its trajectory. It's about 200, 300 grams away from the line that the child should be growing. In this instance, if we sort of enforce, people will think, okay, the mother is not trying to, but properly feeding the child. And sometimes what happens in the field is that they will sort of say, keep on breastfeeding. But for three months, the baby had been breastfed very well. So of course, the learning period for both mother, even if it was a primary, as well as the baby would have been now passed and they have got very well. So they chose, provided there had been no other insult like uh, acute illness or anything, this is shows a clear deficit in the calorie requirement to match the growth of the individual. So in this instance, of course, waiting for another two weeks even is detrimental because it will take the same trajectory as it has been and it will go into the yellow zone. And then we are depriving and bringing them up will be a little bit of a difficult task. So at this point, it is advisable to immediately start on complementary feeding and structure the breastfeeding. Because once you have 
uh, gone away from a single food item, I don't think you could use the exclusive or on-demand feeding because they had to be structured. Now, if the baby was only on breastfeeding, then of course, when the baby feels hungry, you can just allow the breast. But here, you're talking something, a rest, less calorie dense food item, and you are trying to sometimes match it with a high calorie dense food item. Now, if a complementary food is properly prepared, volume to volume, with breast milk, it will provide almost double the kilo, the calorie content. So you are depriving, you are taking the volume of the stomach and providing with a low volume food item. So it is important that we introduce complementary feeding without any further due, although the mother is available, or even if she goes to work within one hour, she could come back. All those things have to be left aside, but to concentrate and start on uh, complementary feeding immediately, not to wait till six months. Thank you, sir. Uh, we often see the problem in uh, not looking at the trajectory. Uh, often there are babies who are in the low zone or you start with a lower birth weight and you are in the orange or the red zone according to the public uh, health uh, team. So they often, uh, the parents are worried that the child is in the zone which is endangered. But then uh, according to the trajectory, child is growing. So what sort of advice should we give to that type of parents? Well, the trajectory is going, but of course we have to establish the trajectory. Now what happens is we have to, ultimately they may go on the minus three line or still perfectly maybe normal, but we have to refer straight away to the weight for length chart and make sure that they lie between the minus two, at least minus one to minus two, ideally, at least within the safe zone of minus two to plus two level. So if they are, I mean, ideal would be you can't get them onto the exactly onto the median, but anything between the minus one to plus one would be a nice zone to grow proportionately. So without any wasting. But if the child, I mean, any of these child, now the weight for age chart is actually a screening tool because it is very crude. It gives a in mass weight of the individual. It does not give any proportionate. So in that context, you have to see whether the child is getting going pro properly because if the child's weight for length is less than minus two or minus three, then of course it's not a very healthy state because that has to be proportionate. So any of these children should be immediately plotted on the, the length should be measured, plot them on the weight for length, see whether they are in an acceptable zone. If they are in the proportionate zone, then of course, the growth potential of the individual may be that, say that child is now this child, or a child who is going on the minus 2 SD, in the weight for length chart is in the media. Then of course, you have to be happy with that and make sure that they do not fall in that line and keep on, but of like that. So you have to see <clears throat> not only one parameter, because this is a good screening tool, especially to, for the field worker to use. And then any deviation immediately upward downwards to refer. But of course, the trajectory is more or less to a great extent depends on the birth provided the child is a term baby as well as normal weight. But any deviations you have to have uh, cross uh, referred with the weight for <clears throat> length chart and make sure that the child is growing properly and then bring it back to the weight for age chart and say, okay, this is what you have to screen and then if there is any deviation, let us know. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the case two is a seven month old baby was brought uh, as the mother is worried that the baby is not gaining enough weight and has poor appetite. Baby is active and developmentally normal. The weight for age chart is given below. Outline your management. So basically we have a chart where the baby has grown normally up to about four to five months of age and the trajectory is going downwards. So it is actually probably more than a simple food calorie deviation because he has not gained over a period of time. So these are the ones which you can't waste time, but you have to do a thorough examination as well as basic investigation and identify a secondary malnutrition underlying cause for these individuals. And then to go on, uh, then based on that, you have to maybe treat that underlying condition. It may be even severe iron deficiency state that had been established at this time, sitting in this time, and we have to correct that. So this is actually a very, very sort of, you have to consider this as a medical emergency, 
and then deal with it. And uh, if there had been probably now, even uh, it's a little bit of exaggerated chart drawing, but those that type of a thing could have been deviated gradually and measurements would have been ignored, thinking it would get corrected. And this type of a thing that would easily could happen if the previous chart, what I showed, would have been neglected. So these are things which have to be considered as medical emergencies and attend to them. What are the pathological causes that you have to exclude in this type of cases? Well, if there are any obvious ones like respiratory tract infections could have been one of the things, especially if there are uh, older siblings who are attending school and who are falling ill, the, uh, the, the more un, uh, the ones who are really not quite visible is the urinary tract infection. And most of these children would come up with urinary tract infection. Also, I think Micronutrient supplementation has to be looked into whether it had been done or not. Because sometimes, although how much you cal calories you provide, the calories cannot be utilized properly unless they have the micronutrient also, which are the coenzymes of the function of the body. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is a growth chart of a nine-month-old baby who came for the routine immunization. Mother is concerned that the size of the child is size of the child compared to the same age children is low. So, how would you advise this mother? The trajectory lies uh, in the orange zone, or your minus one to minus two SD. I think I provided the answer for this in the previous uh, discussion in the first slide. So, it is that you have to refer to the wait for height, uh, sorry, height, wait for height chart and see whether this child is proportionately growing. But on the other hand also, you have to see whether the height is also appropriate for the age because the height may also be a small. Then, of course, you have to go back and see whether mid-parent light, of course, it may not be quite easy at this age to get the mid-parent light, but a crude way of doing that is to go and plot it on the at the 19th year in the 5 to 19 year old chart and see where they are lying. If the mid parental height is lying, mid parental height is somewhere in the median and on either side, then of course, this child, if it is in the minus three, then you have to see whether any correctable problem is there because there may be underlying hidden congenital heart disease, maybe a renal tract infection, urinary tract infection with a renal disease. So, or this child may have had a sort of a antenatal problem, there would have been some form of a, uh, insult during the antenatal period and the potential of the child may be low. So this cannot be just simply say it is normal. It may be normal, but of course you have to do a little bit of homework where you have to go for the uh, height for age as well as height for weight for height. And then you come back and see whether the weight for height, height sorry, whether the height for age is correct to the matching of the parents. And then if it is so, then of course you can say this is quite where the height of the child is matches the parent's height. And then the weight for height is in the median or at least within the minus one to plus one range. And then you can say, okay, this one is weight wise is a small fellow, but otherwise he's healthy, proportionately growing. So in other words, sir, you want to make sure that this is not a chronically malnourished child who is stunted uh, or child who is having a, some congenital or some problem since birth as compared to a child who has been going well and suddenly dropped the weight in the previous slide, which, which we have shown. Yeah, Madam, we, sorry. Yeah, we have to provide the maximum opportunity for them to gain the maximum height that they were born with, destined to get. So otherwise, I mean, even two, three centimeters, if they become short, they may be sort of losing some career prospects like if they are, they are Aspiration. So, what we have to target is to get the maximum for the height if possible. Yeah, madam. No, no, just one correction. When you say height for age, it should be length for age. Sorry. Just another thing, sir. What is the role of MUAC, uh, mid arm circumference, in this age, picking up children with mal malnourishment in this age? Yeah, malnourishment. Moak. Um, MOAC is, of course, used for rapid screening mainly in one to five year age group. But, of course, research has been done in various ways, even to use in the pregnant mother sometimes. Uh, I mean, if you have the best ways to get the direct weight if possible, 
and the direct correct length or height measured that possible. But uh, in rapid screening, of course, it does not happen that much in this country. For that, you can use it's an easy way sort of viewing, but of course, it's not the most definite way. So it basically looks at the uh, soft tissue uh, content and looking at the, especially at the muscle mass to a great extent. But uh, as a screening tool, it has a place. But of course, for definitive diagnosis, of course, it is not. And especially for overnutrition, it does not have any space proven so far. Thank you, sir. So in your definition, sir, in the third case, it's not a case of weight faltering as compared to the previous slide, which is a case of weight no, faltering. No, it is not a weight faltering. It is just gaining. We have to make sure that this gain or this trajectory is physiological and healthy. That is what. So it cannot be just done just because it is driving parallel, still we have to make sure we are not taken away or not deprived the children of anything because whether he is having, this is the maximum potential of this child is what we have to ensure. So in other words, uh, are you going to say that uh, not necessarily all children with Sam or ma'am may not have a weight faltering and vice versa? Uh, all weight faltering children may not be in the Sam or ma'am category. No, no. Well, uh, again, weight faltering has to be decided on the weight for length or weight for height chart. So this is the weight for age chart. Again, this will show the trajectory. And as I said, it is the best, I mean, reasonably good screening tool where you more than the MOAC. So you just weigh it, you plot it, and then you have it. And then you see whether, but for that, we have to ensure that his destined or inherent capacity of growth is this ideal for his uh, future. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for that very informative case discussion. And I would uh, hand over the uh, Madam Chairperson to uh, ask the questions. And uh, before I wind off, uh, it's been a great privilege again to be with my very honored esteemed teachers and Madam Chairperson, another teacher of ours who is again a very esteemed teacher. And in the audience, uh, we have uh, Professor Lama Batsuria, again, one of the very esteemed teachers. Thank you very much, SLMA, and over to Madam Chairperson to take over. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Amadi. There are a few questions from the participants. Uh, So, sir, I think I, actually I spoke to a veterinary surgeon. Huh? Yes. Um, um, my understanding is no, because uh, the what the, the sort of the, the idea is that you know you give hormones to add to hormones to chicken feed or whatever, and they get they get uh, fat and that gets into the this thing. But apparently, chicken having a small lifespan does not have hormones, but when you have this uh, battery, battery, whatever the style raised chicken, there's a lot of fat, which which can contribute. So I'm not exactly sure what Pujita, what what is your take on that? There are certain things coming up. Uh, I can't remember exactly the terminology, but they use is uh, because the aromatic cycles I think does not really break. So it potentiates the growth of certain hormones within the body. So not the direct uh, effect of the broiler chicken, but some of the substrate it provides through these injected hormones, which are chemically not altered, would potentiate. But I, I, I mean, there is, it's coming up. Uh, the research is being done. Still, it is not a very, very well established phenomena. But of course, there is a little bit of a caution at the moment regarding that. So, to some extent, yes, but I don't know if there is production wise whether there is a distinction, sir, because at the end of the day, it is the producers have to be honest. That's a luxury now. Uh, this question is to Pujita. Uh, what are the options available for children with uncomplicated SAM who refuse or do not tolerate BP100? Well, of course, the main thing is to provide the food. I mean, BP100 is not a magical food item. It is actually a calorie-dense food item, which we are trying to provide to a child who has a very, very minimum appetite 
and to capitalize on that by giving a high density calorie item. Mm -hmm. So if we can increase the calorie density in the home based preparations by adding a little bit of more oil, things like that, as well as to a reasonable amount, we may have to put a little bit of carbohydrates like in the form of sugars initially, not to induce a palate to I mean, in the taste buys. That way we, we, we will be able. So there may be food items where the child is uh, child likes to eat, which because there is no magic in BP hunter. People think that this is a magical treatment. No, it is just only a calorie rich food item. So that calorie, if we can, as I said, 500 kilocalories in about 100 grams. So if we can even reach about 300, 350 kilocalories in our home based preparation per 100 grams, gradually we may not get a speedy recovery as much as we see with BP 100 perhaps, but of course we will be able to recover them and that would be a much more important thing in the long run and actually I must say also one thing that the gut, gut micro, microbiome is very very important in management of malnutrition because there have been studies showing that the indigenous food plays a huge role in the management if you try to feed a child only on these artificial food items they will not do well because the gut microbe will not be favored by these foreign uh, food items. So for the growth of the indigenous uh, microflora, it is important that you introduce the uh, local brood or locally prepared uh, food as well. So it is just like the whole where the total parental nutrition we went away and we are going to parental nutrition with enteral nutrition. So as much as like that, here the food item should not be something only from outside, but also definitely inside. And if you can definitely, because the new guide also promotes much more home-based food items than providing the uh, reduced therapeutic food. So that's the important thing that you should not be get, you should not get carried away thinking this is a magic bullet that is going to kill a uh, cure uh, under nutrition. And another question to you. Uh, as while somebody is congratulating you on the excellent lecture, uh, can what can we give instead of triposha as it is not available at present? And another on the same thing, can summer posha, yaha posha, available in market substitute triposha? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't want to go by commercial names, but anything what you can do is you can look at the label and see whether there is a reasonable good calorie content in that. And once you have purchased that, you can enhance the calories by adding a little bit of coconut, maybe a little bit of flavoring, sugar addition, things like that you can make into that and uh, improve the quality of that uh, by uh, from calorie point of view. So definitely, I mean, any of those preparations are acceptable. Another question to you. Uh, should we routinely supplement IV or oral thymine, 2 milligrams per kg for patients with SAM, uh, considering the risk of pre-feeding syndrome? Yeah, depending on the duration, of course, it is needed if it is sort of definitely acute and severe malnutrition. But of course, definitely oral time is more than enough. There is no need of any parental because that is actually mainly needed for adult alcoholics who are on going on to who have developed chronic uh, time in deficiency. But these children, they have a little bit of not being able to manage the time in requirement or the time in demand with the to when we are uh, providing them with excess calories. So the metabolism will go into problem and then they will enter into the refeeding syndrome. This is to you. Uh, can di type 1 diabetes mellitus lead to childhood adult onset obesity? Uh, what is the incidence, not heritability, of obesity due to genetic causes? Yeah, so type 1 diabetes, I think, especially in adolescents, depending on how much insulin you take, if you take a 
large amount of insulin, you definitely can become obese. So uh, uh, the endocrinologist should monitor the insulin intakes because insulin increases hunger and you eat. So that, that's, that's one. Uh, I think the genetic thing about obesity, there is, a, there is a, a, a quite a lot of data on polygenic, polygenic uh, increase in incidence of obesity. There's a, risk, there's a polygenic risk score which has been looked at in various uh, populations. It's not just one, one thing, like lots of genes have a small contribution towards obesity. That's why we see obesity in families because I think they all share the same genetic thing. So practically in our case, we are, we, since we don't have that kind of data, the best thing is if we pick up somebody deviating from the, from the growth curve, then, then we need to act because some those, those uh, children with polygenic risk, high polygenic risk for obesity, We'll start deviating from the growth curve quite early onwards. So I think, as I said, the, the 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 thing to do is to actually plot their growth parameters very regularly. So you can pick up both children who are going upwards as well as downwards. So I mean, the the my take home message is for everybody, not only pediatricians, the primary healthcare uh, doctors, that they need to plot the anthropometric measurements on the chart, which are readily available. So that, that way, it's very very convenient and easy to refer. Actually, adding on to that, most of the time, especially in pediatric practice, I mean, I'm not referring to pediatrician as Professor Sahan said, at GP practice, most of the time, the weights will be measured. And if it takes, if you are sort of familiar with the chart, it takes less than 30 seconds for you to plot it. So if you just put a dot where the weight measurement was happening, and as well as once in six months, if the height could be plotted, that is the most requirement, then of course, uh, I think uh, that would do a lot more justice than uh, to these children with growth content. Also, do you routinely supplement vitamin D after birth? No, there is no such program. And uh, we have been looking into this, especially to whether to supplement mothers as well as children at different ages. But of course, I think the data did not really support that to a great extent. But of course, from time to time, it is under review. And uh, at the moment, there is no routine program for vitamin D supplementation because there are a lot of schools of thought whether these cutoff levels are quite correct or the assessment method is correct and things like that. So at the moment, there is no program uh, for vitamin D routine supplementation. If the child is already on vitamin supplement containing iron, iron develop SAM uh, with complications, do we need to change vitamin supplement to iron free one, one during this period? Yeah, it would be better because sometimes, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very sort of a, there is no hard and fast rule, but if the person had been on iron supplements and then, of course, changing may be useful because you are feeding the child and uh, there can be a lot of flora changes that occurs with the initial feed feeding. And what we know is that the tight junctions in the gut mucosa are not very good. So there is a high chance of high bacteria load, translocating and giving rise to bacteremia, plus or minus uh, septicemia. So I think it's always better safe cutting down the, because iron usually should be given as an individual. It does not come with other material, other, other compounds usually because if there are multiple micronutrients with iron sometimes may not work properly. So I think the best thing is you stop that. Provide vitamin A, zinc and B group of vitamin enriched uh, vitamin supplementation and then later on you can add the iron. Thank you so much. I think now it's time to call it a day. On behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, I take this opportunity to thank Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians for collaborating with us, all three speakers, the participants uh, who were virtually present, Professor Lama Batsuria, and the parts, there are, I think, 120 participants online. We thank everybody and for the questions also.
ask you for.